Hey guys, I'm your host, Tara A. Devlin, and welcome to this week's episode of Koobana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. My latest novella, Ghost in the Box, is now out. If you want a quick jaunt through a creepy ghost story that will keep you guessing until the end, then check it out on Amazon right now. We also have a brand new design up in the Kawabana merchandise store. You can check that out at kawabana.store. We have shirts, mugs, stickers, masks, and much more, so do check it out and help support the show at the same time. This week, we're taking a look at some terrifying tales that will make you question whether it's really worth satisfying your curiosity or not. Perhaps some things really should be left in the dark. First up, a group of three young men decide to go on an occult tour and visit a shrine that venerates something called Fukuro-san. What is this mysterious item and will they regret digging deeper into the mystery? Find out in Fukuro-san. It was the spring of my second year of university. On this particular day, I left in the morning for an occult tour with two of my friends, K and S. It was Kei-kun, a genuine occultist, who suggested the idea, and our mode of transportation was S's car. It was always the three of us, and it was always this type of situation. The car drove down a narrow country road, flanked on either side by mountains and rice fields. S drove, while I sat in the passenger seat, and K sat in the back. Our destination was a shrine in a village roughly two hours from our hometown. According to Kay, there was something terribly strange and interesting that was venerated as a kami in that shrine. And this thing, if we go there, are they going to show it to us? Hmm? Ah, yeah, it should be fine. I think. Kay answered from the back seat, his tone sickly. He was not a car person. I've already contacted the priest. I told him that the three of us are serious students with an interest in folklore. Oh man, I'm going to be sick. We'd been on countless occult tours before, but when necessary, we always contacted places for an appointment before going. Kay was the one who generally dealt with such matters. Most places flat out refused, but sometimes, like this time, we actually got a response. Well, even if we didn't get permission, it was like, well, we tried, and we'd still go anyway. So then, what's enshrined there? I turned to the back seat and Kay was slumped over on his side. He answered from that spot. A bag. A bag, I repeated. That shrine had a bag enshrined there. Oh no, do you have a bag? I'm gonna chuck. S, who was driving in silence, stopped the car on the side of the road. Kay stumbled out, wandered into the forest a little, and then had an emotional reunion with his breakfast. After a short drive, we arrived at the village. It was a small village built in the mountains, and we quickly found the shrine. At the entrance stood a stone shrine gate. We parked the car on the shoulder of the road so it was out of the way, and then got out. Kay seemed to have revived somewhat. Whatever happens, don't throw up on the shrine grounds. There is a god here, after all, S said, turning towards Kay. I'm not going to throw up. There's nothing left to throw up anyway. And I didn't know you were a believer. When in Rome. And anyway, we have to be serious folklore majors right now, don't we? Beyond the shrine gate, some gentle stairs spread out at a distance that looked like it could easily be reached by bike. And beyond that was a building that looked like the main hall. We passed under the gate and started towards the shrine. Tree branches and leaves above my head blocked some of the sunlight. The light filtered through the forest and every time the wind blew, the shadows changed shape at my feet. 
The air I inhaled felt different here. We passed an old woman with a bent back on our way towards the shrine. She looked at us, and then smiled with a wrinkly face. We lowered our heads in greeting, and Kay said a quick hello. She was no doubt visiting the shrine. The shrine grounds weren't very large. There was the Hall of Worship, and then the main shrine behind it. On the right-hand side of the approach was the water to purify your hands and mouth with. I think they call that place a Suibansha? Anyway, there was a shrine next to that that was larger than a full-grown person. And near that was a man with a broom doing some cleaning. He must have been in his late forties or so, and he wore a blue jumper with jeans. Ah, and are you the students who called? He looked over at us and then smiled, meaning he had to be the priest. He was a lot younger than I was expecting. We introduced ourselves, and the priest, who apparently was a yuzu farmer most of the time, pointed with the handle of his broom to a small shrine next to us. And you'll find the Fukuro-san that you called me about in there. Why don't we go have a good look at it first? It seemed that what we were looking for was inside that small shrine. The priest urged us to take a look inside. Behind the double doors, there was something strange placed on a pedestal. Fukuro-san. Just like the priest said, it was a bag. It seemed to be made of hemp. It was light brown and about the size of a human head. The top was tied with a red string. If that were the extent of it, then it would just be some weird item, but even more strangely, this bag was covered the whole way around with needles stuck into it. There were marking needles, sewing needles, long needles and short needles, all sorts of needles. I called it Hukuro-san just now, but it doesn't actually have a name. My father called it Hedgehog Summer, the priest said, placing his hands on the roof. Is the legend true that if you poke a needle into this thing, then all your past sins and mistakes will disappear? I looked at the bag full of needles as Kay spoke. Ah, I get it. So this wasn't just any regular old bag then. But it didn't look like anything special enough to have a legend told about it either. That's right, the legend is true. Of course, it's up to you whether you want to believe it or not. The old folks from the village believe it, and they often come here to poke it. Do you kids want to try? If there's something you feel guilty about, you should try it. We all looked at each other. I shook my head. K chuckled and S shrugged his shoulders. No doubt all three of us thought we had nothing to hide. That couldn't be further from the truth, huh? Ha 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 ha, I see, I see. You lead an honest life. That is for the best the priest said with a cute laugh. Well, I'm going to go sweep over there for a bit. Come get me if you need anything. The priest made his way towards the main shrine and left the three of us behind. We turned to observe the Fukuro-san in the small shrine once again. A bag that cleanses your sins if you put a needle in it. I've never heard anything like that before, S muttered. Mm, the name Fukuro-san is a bit weird. If you add O oh in front of it, then it means mother instead, I remarked. He said it doesn't have a proper name, right? Fukuro-san is just what the visitors call it. Alright, let's get to it. We didn't come here today just to look at this bag, did we? Having said that, S turned to look at K. I I had the same thought. It was true that the bag full of needles was strange, but that alone wouldn't be enough to set off Kay's occult antenna. To be honest, this place was no different to the statues of Buddha placed in temples. Kay then laughed. 
Of course not. What we came to see today isn't this bag. Then he grabbed S and I by our shirts and pulled us closer. What we came to see today is what's inside the bag, he whispered. The inside of the bag. I had thought that it was just full of cotton, but judging by Kay's tone of voice, that wasn't so. There's a certain rumour regarding this bag. Apparently, it moves and groans when you poke a needle in it. Like, maybe there's an animal inside. Where there's smoke, there's fire. Is there really an animal inside? Or perhaps... At that moment, I heard a scream coming from nearby. Without thinking, I turned to look at the bag, but the scream was coming from higher up. A crow or some black bird took off flying. And how exactly are we going to get him to show us the inside of the bag? I asked Kay after regaining my composure. The priest we had just spoken to seemed friendly, but would he really go out of his way to show us the contents of the bag? Not to mention, the bag was pierced full of countless needles. You'd have to pull them out one at a time to get a look inside. I'm not saying we have to see it with our own eyes. The quickest way would be to ask the priest about it. That's why I called him. Although, I don't know if he'll answer us. And you just want to ask him, that's all. If what he says is convincing, sure. And so, we went over to the priest to ask him. He was cleaning around the main shrine. I haven't been doing much cleaning lately, so things are a bit of a mess, haha. <laughs> the priest, who was cleaning beneath the shrine, laughed as we approached him. Then he stood up and dusted himself off. Was there something you wanted to ask? Ah, yes. What's inside that Hukuro-san? Kay went straight for the kill without any kind of lead-in. After a brief pause, the priest looked at him. Why do you ask? Are you going to write about it in your school report? Ah, uh, yes, exactly. What a liar, I thought. But the priest gave a gentle smile. You better take notes so you don't forget. Kay was shocked at his response and... Seeing that, the priest laughed. It's fine, it's fine. I understand. We've had young people like you come here before. Well, at least you were polite about it. You made sure to contact us first and all. It seemed the priest had seen right through us. Can you show us what's inside it? I'm sorry, but I can't do that. There was a firmness to his calm tone. No matter how many times we asked, he would always answer the same way. No. I cannot tell you what's inside it. Ah, but if one of you decides to succeed this shrine, then I can tell you. Huh? How about it? A great idea, right? It was impossible to tell if he was being serious or making fun of us. We just smiled faintly at him. In the end, the priest didn't tell us anything about the Hukuro-san. We thanked him and then left the shrine. Once we got back to the car, Kay let out all his anger. Screw that old geezer! Keeping it between priests just makes me want to know even more. Maybe he was watching us, so that we didn't do anything weird to it. S sat down in the driver's seat and then tilted it back. You think so? I asked. You heard what he said, right? He's seen people like us before. But unlike us, they didn't call to make an appointment. But the fact he called them young people means that he knows about them and... They must have done something, yeah? So he was there, the priest. That old guy didn't look like he was on duty there very much, did he? Well, he was there just before, but... When you say they must have done something to it, 
What do you mean? How would I know? Don't ask me. Then Kay muttered something. A curse. S and I turned to look at him in the back seat. That's it. They did something to the bag and then they were cursed. That's gotta be it. And then they went crying to the old man about it. No way. S refuted him immediately. You think so? I reckon I'm on the right track here. Yet S's denial caused him to deflate somewhat. So, what are we going to do? I asked Kay. He gave a small grunt and then kicked the back of the driver's seat. Hey, S, let's get out of here. Then he leaned back and closed his eyes. We've done all we can, he said. We called in advance to see the bag. We heard there was something inside it, but the priest wouldn't show us even after we asked. If he said no, then there was nothing we could do about it. And so, in the end, we had no choice but to look without permission. That night, we parked the car a short distance from the shrine, and Kay and I walked through that stone shrine gate once again, with a torch in our hands. S didn't join us. I'm tired, was all he said, and so he remained in the car to sleep. The atmosphere in the shrine grounds was completely different to that morning. The rustling of the trees had been so refreshing when we first arrived, but now it sounded like the breath of some unknowable creature. There it is, Kay said. The small shrine next to the water basin. The door that was open that morning was now closed. We approached it for a better look and it seemed it was locked. As I was pondering what to do, Kay approached the shrine. Shine that light on the door for me, would ya? He said. He took something out of his pocket. It looked like a thin screwdriver and some wire. Before long, there was a bang and the door came off. Kay placed it slowly on the ground and then sighed. He reached inside the small shrine and grabbed the Fukuro-san. Then he gently placed it on top of the door. Wow. We're right out here committing a crime, I muttered. But it's the perfect crime, Kay said. Tomorrow, nobody will be any the wiser. Naturally, once we saw what was inside the bag, we would put it all back and then leave. A bird does not foul the nest it is about to leave. That's just good manners for someone involved in the occult, Kay always said. I shone the light from the torch over the bag from all angles. It really was full of needles. Then I noticed that the red thread tied around the mouth of the bag also had a single needle through it. Was it heavy? I asked. No, not really. Maybe one kilo? Kay and I looked at each other. Well then, let's do it. Kay grabbed the first needle. Then he pulled it out. The end of the needle that was stuck in the bag was a different colour to the rest. It gave off a silvery sheen. One by one, he pulled the needles out, placing them inside an empty tissue box we'd brought from the car. It seemed he wasn't planning on opening the bag until he had removed each and every needle. Maybe he was hoping that something might happen as he was taking them out. As I shone the light on the bag, I counted the needles. I counted 41 by the time he was halfway through. Then I suddenly remembered that the number of needles were the number of times someone had committed some horrible deed. It hit me that we might be doing something very, very wrong. But still, Kay kept pulling the needles out. There were about 20 left, and then we suddenly heard a cry. I looked around the area. Was it a bird? No, it sounded more like a cat, or maybe a baby. A baby, a 
chill ran down my spine at the word. Kay's hand stopped. Did he hear it too? It was still going, but I couldn't make out where it was coming from. It could be coming from the bushes to our left, or maybe from beneath the main hall to the right. Maybe it was coming from the sky above us, or maybe from the ground beneath us. Or maybe it was coming from the bag between us. The bag. It moved just slightly. I screamed and jumped back before I could stop myself. Kay didn't budge. Wind rustled through the trees and something continued to cry. A sound echoed in my head like an error from a computer. In my experience, when that happened, something very bad was about to go down. My eyes widened. Kay was still trying to remove needles from the bag. Kay, that's enough! I screamed. But not only did he not stop, he didn't seem to hear me at all. As I stood up, my legs trembled. I could feel the blood flowing through my veins pump faster and faster. The beating of my heart, which I could feel through the vibrations of my bones, was just like a drum being hit. What on earth should I do? Should I hit Kay to make him stop? Should I go and call S? I didn't know. I couldn't move. Knock him out! I heard a voice and, in that instant, my body moved and both hands sent Kay flying. A light shone on me and I came back to my senses. Before us stood the priest, wearing the same clothes he had on that morning. Well, well. I came here because I was worried and I see that it wasn't unfounded. The priest then looked at the door on the ground and the bag on top of it. Then he sighed. You complete and utter fool. I'm s- sorry. Kay was still lying where I shoved him, so I had no choice but to apologize to the priest by myself. Well, I'm just glad that I got here in time. If you had seen what's inside, then... Then he looked at Kay lying on the ground. Help him up. You two have something you must do. After shaking his shoulders a few times, Kay opened his eyes. He looked at the priest for a moment, his eyes unfocused, and then suddenly he came back to his senses. I'm so sorry! He screamed and threw himself on the ground. It's fine, it's fine. Now, which of you removed the needles? Ah, that was me. Kay finally raised his hand. I see. Well then, you will be the one to put them back in. Each time you do, the corruption in your soul will be purged. As will your sins and your mistakes. You might feel sorry, yes, but make sure you put each and every single needle back in very neatly. Can you see something? Kay asked nervously. No doubt you would be terrified if I said I could. But sadly, I cannot. But this bag has always been a little like that, you know? And those youngsters that came here previously, well... When they saw it, they never came back. A chill ran down my spine. Kay said nothing more and got to work putting all the needles back in. But having said that, who knows? They might come back again at some point. As Kay silently put all the needles back in, the priest muttered something. Listen to me while you're doing that. This bag isn't really called Hukuro-san. It has another name. Its real name is Inugayashi. Kei and I looked at the priest in surprise. Then he gave us a gentle smile and continued. If curiosity killed the cat, then I thought I should kill the curiosity first. But you must promise never to speak of this to anyone else. We both nodded. Then the priest told us about the bag. Inu Gaeshi, 
It was written with the characters for dog and return. Inside the bag was the carcass of an animal. Everything inside it had been removed, then it was mummified before being placed in the bag. Everything inside is taken out so that it becomes a container, not a living thing. Then all of the filth, the corruption that a person's soul possesses is transferred to the container. The purpose of the Inugayashi is to cleanse that impurity. Oh, and don't get me wrong, these animals, they live out their full lives first. According to the priest, the mummy inside the bag at that moment had once been a cat. My father used rats and such, but well, the needles don't stick very well. He said they weren't very good. And there have been boars, snakes, even dogs. As long as it's an animal, anything is fine, the priest said. Then, when the needles are full of impurities, the mummy is taken and venerated in the main shrine. It becomes a kami, thanks to the bitterness it takes from humans over such a long period of time. It's something that carries humans' impurities on their behalf. Nowadays, the kami of agriculture is venerated here, but in the past, it was these mummies that were worshipped as the main deity. They called it O Inusama. So then, would it not be accurate to say that this kami was just a large lump of human impurities, of bitterness, and that was what this shrine venerated? It is not just the distinguished that become kami-sama in Shinto, but those with power as well, the priest said, as though he had read the doubts in my mind. Even though it was full of bitterness, of resentment, that was still power, and it led to becoming a kami. I'm done, I think. As we were talking, Kay had put the last needle back in. After confirming that he had done so, the priest took something out of his pocket and handed it to us. It was a needle for each of us. This is for the mistake you have made today. Make sure you properly apologize as you put it in. I'm sorry for doing wrong. I didn't mean any ill out of it. Truly, I'm sorry. That was what I thought as I put the needle in. Okay, and with that, you are all good. Then we put the bag back in its original place, put the door back on, and once again, we apologized to the priest. It's fine, it's fine. As long as you learn something from this. Don't do anything stupid again, okay? With that, the priest gave us one final, painful slap to the head each, and then laughed. If you get the opportunity, please do come back again. When we got back to the car, S, who had just woken up from his nap, burst out laughing when he saw the look on our faces. I had no idea what that look was, though. Still, I think we learnt a lot from this occult tour. I thought about it as I stared out the window at the mountains rolling by in the darkness. Suddenly, I turned to look at Kay sitting in the back seat, and he seemed to be reflecting as well. He looked deep in thought, staring at his feet, but then he suddenly looked up and muttered something to me. After hearing what that old guy said, I reckon that maybe there was a human mummy in that shrine too. What do you think? And what if there was? Then I'll ask him to show us. And if he says no? Well then, we'll have done all we can. Ah, uh, no. Um, eh? Hey, S, what should I do? What the hell should I do? For now, why don't you just shut up? Correction. It seemed that we didn't learn anything on this occult tour. 
Curiosity killed the cat. Maybe that was the only thing we learnt. Well, still, that was one big step for all of us. Ghost photos. When you think of a ghost photo, maybe the image of something ghostly lurking in the background comes to mind. But what if that ghostly presence moved every time you looked at the photo? And what if it was coming towards you? Find out what happens in... He's coming. Takayanagi-kun and Kawashima-kun from the soccer club were such good friends that it was almost like they were twins. At the top of both sports and study, they were always ranked first and second. Of course, they were incredibly popular in class as well, and if the two of them ever missed school, then it was like a light had gone out and all joy was missing from the class. I'm a girl, but I was in the same soccer club as them, and I also lived nearby as well, so I often hung out with both of them. Personally, I was proud of that. I was small and weak, and I wasn't that smart either, but the fact that I could spend time with those two was something that I felt made me perhaps just a little better than everyone else. This happened, I believe, when we were in the third grade of elementary school. We went fishing together in a small creek near home. It has since been filled in and no longer exists. I was carrying an instant camera at the time that my father gave me for my birthday. It was something that I always had with me, and so I decided to take a photo of the two of them with it. Looking back on it now, if I hadn't taken that camera with me, if I hadn't taken that photo, then none of this would have happened. When I got home and looked at the photo, I noticed something. There was something next to Takayanagi-kun and Kawashima-kun. Just a little below Kawashima-kun's right arm, there was something reflected in the surface of the water that appeared to be a human eye. I was aware of the term ghost photography at the time, but I never once thought that I might take such a photo. So while I thought it was kind of creepy, I didn't think much more of it than that. It was a few days after that that Kawashima-kun injured his right arm during soccer practice. We were at a tournament for elementary schools in the city, and the ball hit his arm, breaking it. He ended up in the hospital. Something didn't feel right, so when I got home, I pulled that photo out of my desk drawer and looked at it again. It was completely different to before. A small boy was poking his face out of the water, and his eyes were the same that I had seen that first time around. And this time, he was grabbing Kawashima-kun's right arm. I was so scared that I called Takayanagi-kun's house and asked him to come over. I then showed him the photo. I think Kawashima will be rather shocked if he sees this, he said. And so, we promised not to speak of the photo to him, and Takayanagi-kun took it with him. Then, I think it was about three days after Takayanagi-kun took the photo, Kawashima-kun passed away. He jumped out the window of his hospital room. Someone from our class went to see him that day, and they said that he kept muttering something at regular intervals. He's coming. The doctor and Kawashima-kun's mother said that it must have been because of the stress of being in hospital, but I think that the real reason was... One day, Takayanagi-kun called me over to his house, and he showed me the photo again. That boy was no longer there. The photo had been cut in half, and the only one in it was Takayanagi-kun. I thought he might come for me next, was all he said. When Kawashima-kun died, apparently the boy in the photo was clinging to him. Why didn't you cut the photo sooner? If you had, then maybe... I said, my voice rough with emotion. But then Takayanagi-kun answered. 
because with him around, I could never be the best. In the evening sun, his face looked just like that of the boy in the photo. Festivals are a popular and common pastime in Japan, and many of them are held in and around shrines on mountains. For this next story, two friends visit a festival that takes place near a popular sunrise location. But there's something on the other side of the path that shouldn't be messed with, and they're about to find out why. This one's called Festival on the Mountain. This happened more than 10 years ago. There was a festival held at a shrine on the mountain every year, and I went there with my friend. There was a slightly open area about halfway up the mountain, perfect for watching the sunrise, so there were more than a few people who set up their tents there to spend the night. There was another open area opposite it on the hiking trail, but there was something like an old run-down barn there, and I had never seen any people go over there. But one year, after the festival, as we were returning down the mountain, my friend suggested that we go check that barn out. I flat out refused. Well then, I'm going to go check it out by myself. You wait here, he said, and left me to wait. He finally returned after quite some time, but his face was pale, like he'd seen something he shouldn't have. He stubbornly refused to say anything and rushed us home. And so, confused, we continued back down the mountain. We continued going to the festival after that, but strangely, whenever we reached that area with the old barn, my friend would say he was going to look inside and then head over. Why, when he had been so scared the first time? Then, when he returned, his face was once again pale, and he refused to talk about what he had seen. I was honestly too frightened to go and look for myself, but I also knew that that was the correct answer to this situation. I tried calling my friend as the festival time approached, but the voice on the other end announced that the number was no longer in use. Out of options, I called his parents to get his contact information, but as it turned out, he disappeared without word a week earlier, and nobody had heard from him since. When they asked me if I had any idea where he might be, I suddenly thought of the barn. I told them about it, as well as what he said and how he acted at the time, and because we had no other clues or leads, I decided to go and check it out. And there he was. Dead. I was so frightened that I ran, so I didn't see him very clearly. According to what I later heard, however, his state was… indescribable. At a glance, he looked perfectly fine with no visible injuries. However, the right half of his body was apparently covered in Shinto charms, and the parts of his body where the charms had come off were rotten. It had been a week since he went missing, so it was unbelievable for his body to look like that in such a short amount of time. But perhaps the most frightening thing of all was that the top screen of my friend's phone had a photo of us on it. Judging by the situation and composition, it was taken the first year my friend went to visit that barn, and it was taken in the direction of the barn. I stopped going to the festival after that. I even stopped going near the mountain itself. Why did my friend visit that barn more than once? Why did he die like that? And why did he have that photo? I want to know, but at the same time, I also kind of don't. Japan is full of supposedly haunted tunnels, but in this next story, there's one in particular that also comes with a creepy announcement. Each and every time the train approaches this one particular tunnel, an announcement plays, asking the passengers to pull their sunshades down. 
Why? What lurks in the darkness of the tunnel? Find out in... Please pull the shades down. I don't remember where this tunnel is, but I think it's somewhere in Gifu. Anyway, before the train passes through the tunnel, an announcement plays, asking everyone to pull down the window shades, and everyone always does this without question. When I asked my parents about it, they just said, because there are monsters out there. At first that terrified me, and I always covered my eyes, until my mother told me it was okay to open them again. But then, the more we passed through that tunnel, I started to think to myself that, I'm a boy, there's nothing that scares me. And so, one day, I decided to look outside. The moment I did, hands. There were hands everywhere. Countless hands, and all of them white. They all pressed together in the vague shape of a face. I was speechless, and in the end, I clung to my parents and hid my eyes. How pathetic, right? Time passed, and when I was a junior high student, and had the opportunity to travel to the countryside by myself, I headed towards that tunnel, wondering which one it was. But in the end, there was no announcement, so I never figured out which one it was. I later asked my parents about it, but they said that we used to close the windows before entering the tunnel because the train was a locomotive, and smoke might get in. But I'm not old enough to have ever been on a locomotive. Was it all an illusion? But my older brother says that he remembers it as well, so I think it must have been real. Has anyone else experienced the same thing? Our final story for this week sees a young man inherit some land from his father, and on this land stands a small shrine. However, when his father appears in his dreams one night and tells him to cut everything down and then never go back again, well, he does just that. At least, until a real estate agent comes knocking and asks if he's interested in selling the land. What will happen if he goes back there again now, all these years later? Find out in Shrine on the Mountain. During my father's time, it was a rather rich mountain. The trees grew straight and tall. In spring, you could collect vegetables, and in autumn, you could collect mushrooms. The sunlight and soil were no different to the surrounding areas, yet there was just one thing that was different there. There was a small shrine in the middle, and inside that shrine was a pure black stone. My father was honestly a rather lazy man, but he never once failed to look after that shrine. It was strange, but I didn't think anything bad of it. It was what it was. When he died, my father left me some final words. Take good care of that shrine. 49 days after he passed, I saw him in my dreams. He looked rather tired, and then he said something to me. Cut down the trees near the shrine immediately. After that, you must never go back there again. The following day I did just that, and sold the timber. We made a lot of money off it, but just like my father told me in my dream, Nothing was planted there again, and the land was made off-limits. At some point, someone asked us to sell that land on the mountain. Before that could be done, they had to inspect the land. My father had been dead for more than 20 years at that point, and I had lived my life without a vent. Maybe it's okay now, I thought, and so I decided to visit the land with the agent. Abandoned for more than 20 years, the land was a mess of vines, ivy, wild roses, and other plants. It was like a wall was blocking us from going any further, keeping us from looking in. I grabbed a vine and slashed it with my sickle. Fu! 
fool! An angry voice screamed into my ear. It was my father's voice. Instinctively, I turned around. Wah! The man who was with me suddenly screamed. I turned to look in his direction, and the vine I had just cut was dripping red, like blood. The two of us fled back to the house, and we never spoke of selling the land again. The land was once more made off-limits, and nobody from our family ever approached it again. A huge thank you and shout-out to this week's Kami Tier member, Christina. It's thanks to your support, along with everyone else, that I'm able to keep doing this show, so thank you very much. Don't forget to pick up Ghost in the Box, available on Amazon right now. And check out our newly revamped merchandise store at koabana.store. And if you'd like to chat about this week's stories, come and join us in the Koabana Discord. You can find that link in the description or on koabana.net. You can also check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Tara A. Devlin for exclusive bonus stories and extras, or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Kawabana Japan for all sorts of Japanese horror you won't find anywhere else. Thanks guys, stay safe and I'll see you again next time for even more Kawabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. Want even more scary stories? Head over to Kawabana.net for new translations every week. You can also join our Patreon for exclusive stories you won't find anywhere else. Head over to koabana.net now.